All right, good afternoon. Um, welcome to, well, week nine. Uh, hopefully your reading week was somewhat restful. Um, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, quite the weather change compared to what it was like during the midterm. <laughs> we're talking like a 30 degree difference. So now we're diving more into the administration side of things, uh, pretty much for the rest of the semester. Most of these lectures are actually fairly short, which is good news. It means we're out of here usually in around an hour. Um, so it is what it is. Uh, it's not the most exciting topics, unfortunately, but I'll try to make them entertaining as much as I can. And our first administrative topic is going to be backup and restore. So we're going to talk about, you know, kinds of backups, why you back up, uh, how you do it in MySQL specifically, because MySQL is extra special, uh, like with everything else it does. And then we're going to talk about what kind of restores and restoring. Okay. So for those of you that don't know, there's a definition included. A backup's a procedure for making extra copies of data for the purpose of restoration in case of loss or damage. How many people in here have experienced loss or damage on their computer? How many of you actually had backups when said thing happened? So from a personal perspective, the best thing that's ever happened for backing stuff up is OneDrive, Google Drive, Dropbox, you know, SugarShare, take your pick. Personally, I'm a big fan of uh, OneDrive because it's so integrated in Windows, you don't need to think about it. It just happens. Um, at work, I was issued a new laptop yesterday, the third one in a month. The one was an old one. The next one, they ordered the wrong drive size. So then they finally substituted the right machine. And um, I was from never touched the machine to having all my stuff on the machine in under half an hour because everything was backed up. So backups are important. So there's a bunch of terminology. We're going to go through these for the most part. Um, we're going to talk about the different styles of backup, hot, cold, uh, full, incremental, and differentials. Uh, what a backup window is, what a backup job is. Um, online, offline, and off-site. Uh, we're going to talk about various things involved with the data. A few of these actually don't have slides, but I'm going to actually address them right now so that they're um, specifically it's backup window and backup job. So a backup window is a time of it's a period of time that your backup backup job is safe to run. So often most enterprises will do their backup window sometime between midnight and 4 a.m. Uh, why is that a good period of time? Well, good period of time because for most enterprises, midnight to 4 a.m. is when their traffic is the lowest. Smaller companies might go from 8 p.m. like 6 a.m. And big corporations that run 24 hours a day, well, they, you know, have procedures for that. Um, a backup job is literally the job that's scheduled to happen during that backup window. So uh, different systems do it differently. Um, so the different kinds of backups you can run. So you have a full backup. A full backup is a complete copy of a partition where we're not specifically talking just about MySQL here. We're talking about, you know, system-wide backups. Um, so a level zero backup or a full backup is the entire partition. That means like, for example, on Windows, it'd be a complete backup of your C drive, the entire thing. So that if your computer shit the bed, you could put in a new drive, restore from back and be exactly where you were before, nothing lost. Um, when you talk about servers, they're not talking so much about the OS partition, they're talking about where the data is stored. Um, often databases are stored on a separate disk than the main operating system for obvious performance reasons. 
So they'll be backing those disks up. An incremental backup is, it's a backup of the files that have changed since the full last full backup. So I'm going to go through more examples now at the bottom that has actually numbers tied to it. Essentially, you do a full backup on Sunday. On Monday, you do an incremental backup. 100 files changed. On Tuesday, you do another incremental backup. Only 20 files changed. However, it's going to do the 100 from yesterday plus the 20 from today. On Wednesday, another 100 file changes, so it's going to be 100 plus 20 plus 100. It's incremental from the very from the full backup. And then you have the differential backup, which is full backup on day one, and then you only keep track of the changes day by day. So on day one, 100 files changed. You back up those 100 files. On day two, only 20 files changed, so you back up those 20 files. On day three, you back up those 100 files. There's advantages to all of them. Disadvantage just to all of them. So assuming a two terabyte drive, and when we're talking about enterprise, two terabytes is not very big. Two terabytes is actually big in a laptop, but it's reasonably sized in a desktop. And if you're talking about servers, often we're talking about, you know, tens of terabytes, not two. So let's, we're gonna go with a two terabyte partition, full backup. Two terabytes, day one, two terabytes, day two, two terabytes, day three, times seven days. Seven times two is 14 terabytes to do your backups. If you do a full snapshot every single day. Now, the full snapshot is the fastest to recover from because you can just put it in a new drive, same size, and it just copies everything back the way it was, reboot the machine, and, you know, Bob's your uncle. You have a functional operating system. Incremental, as I already described, slowly grows throughout the week. So if we have a two terabyte file system on day one, on day, day one, so day two, there's, 100, there's one gig of files that got created or modified. So that'll be one gig. On day two, there's another 200 megs. So now it's 1.2 gigs. On day three, there's, you know, another, you know, 400 megabytes, so now it's 1.6 gigabytes. So the backup keeps growing through the week. It is the next fastest to recover from because what you do is you restore the full backup and then pick the closest day to today to do your restore. And you have all the files. It, there's not a lot of thinking or processing involved in that situation. And our last one is the differential. Um, in the industry, this is actually also known as a delta. You may have heard the phrase delta at some point when you want to do the delta between two files. Also known, what are the differences between the files? A differential backup will do a full backup on day one, incremental on day two, but then what the what's nifty is on day three, it's only the differences since day two that is backed up. And then only the differences since day three is backed up. So in the end, uh, you're using up a lot less disk space. Your backups are much faster to do because what's faster to back up? Two terabytes, 1.2 gigabytes, or 200 megabytes. The 200 megs will be really fast. It also uses up a lot less disk space. And I'll live tuned to a secret. Disk space is not cheap. Like people think, oh yeah, disk space is cheap, it's terabytes. But let's say you've got a big enterprise and you need to back up all the servers and the servers all sitting at 10 gigs or 10 terabytes of drive. Where are those backups going to go? You need at least, you know, seven times that amount for each server. It's insane. So you'll want to do differentials. The thing that sucks about differentials is restoring it. And then when you bring it back, first resource, two terabytes, then it'll do the one gigabyte, and then it'll grab the next day, and you have to go through, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and basically play back the changes day by day. There's advantages to it because you can actually search through the backup set, what's been backed up, so that you know, if you know, oh, 
Kevin. Kevin pulled a smart one. Kevin went and deleted all the files one day. Great. But if we know what day it is, we can just go to the previous day and just grab, you know, whatever Kevin changed, which is good. Um, or vice versa. Kevin copied in a bunch of files. We can go to the previous day and grab just those files that he overwrote. Um, it's easier to keep track of what's changing, but it makes restores much more complex. Okay, so which when we talk about this, we realize how much disk space everything takes up. We have to start talking about backup strategies. Now, ideally, we'd like to back up everything all the time and keep it around forever. Um, for example, the federal government has a, uh, tw a 10 to 14 year data retention policy. Unless it's marked protected B or protected C, then it's 25 years. They basically keep their data forever. And then at the end of 25 years, it gets investigated and they might even keep it for longer. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever driven up Highway 17 towards Pembroke. But when you reach Renfrew, there's a nice looking building right on the side of the highway. It's a giant vault full of paper. Basically put important documents that were kept in Ottawa that were past the retention life, but decided they needed to keep it, were picked up and put into this vault. Air climate controlled, waterproof, dry as a bone, so the paper doesn't, you know, rot. Computers, it makes it easier because it's just files. We can copy them around. But the cost of keeping everything forever would be insane. That's problem number one with keeping things forever too. Backup software changes over the years. I guarantee that almost nobody uses the same backup software I used when I started in the industry. Um, yeah, they still sell it, but the backups from back then don't work today because let you know our secret, the hardware doesn't exist anymore. So you can't buy the, the machines to restore these backups. We use a product called ArcServe way back in the day. It stood for Archive Server. Oh, shocker. And we backed up on tapes. Each tape was 200 megabytes. Nowadays, they're like 200 gigabytes, but or, two, two ter or 10 terabytes of tape because the capacity's gone up. But, you know, backing up a server could take two, three hours. So we have multiple tape drives, and they'd all be backing up different servers. Cloud services makes this easier. You can set up a policy saying, hey, I want you to back this up every day. And you say, I want you to keep so many days of backups. And at the end of these days, you can take a, the oldest snapshot, and move it to cold storage, what they call cold storage. Um, Microsoft calls it cold storage. Amazon, uh, Microsoft calls it cold storage. Amazon calls it Glacier. Um, I'm sure the other cloud providers give it a similar name. It gets backed up to really slow drives that nobody ever touches. Um, like you're talking about copying a hundred megabyte file might take 15 minutes to get it out of there, but it's good forever and it's cheap. So it's a good thing. So realistically, we can't back up everything forever because it's just too expensive to do. So you need a combination of short-term and long-term strategies. Realistically, you should always have three copies. If you're a business, if you're an individual, you know, OneDrive, Dropbox, whatever works for you. Um, but if you're a business, you should have three copies. A backup on the server, a backup to a different server, and then one that is off-site. So the last place I worked, um, what we had was, we had the servers in the server room. They backed up to servers in a closet at the other end of the building, right? So if something happened to the server room, we still had backups at the other end of the building. We didn't have to leave the building to go get the stuff. And then we had another copy off-site, uh, which happened to be in somebody's basement, uh, which was really questionable. Uh, but, you know, he was one of the owners of the company, so what could we say? We had a server sitting in his basement, and data got backed up there every night. Um, 
So, one of the reasons why we didn't keep the backups in the same room as the server room, uh, one day we were adjusting the air conditioning in there, we discovered that the P-trap for the upstairs bathroom was above our server rack. Um, those of you that don't know, know plumbing, the P-trap is the big pipe that comes out of your toilet that goes down to the sewer. It was literally right above our server rack. So if ever the toilet upstairs flooded, it was coming straight into our rack. So we decided maybe we should have the backups at the other end of the building. Um, now with cloud services, this has gotten a little simpler because you would set up your stuff in multiple zones. So you have, you know, we'll use Amazon because that's the one I'm most comfortable with. You have North Carolina, also known as US East One. That's the one every time Amazon has problems, half the internet disappears. Uh, you got West, you got Canada One, Canada Two, Canada Three. So what you do is you set up your servers to operate in one zone, but you set up your backups in a different zone. So that, you know, an asteroid comes out and flattens North Carolina, there's a good chance the ones in California might survive. Probably not because of the earthquakes, but, you know, maybe the ones in Montreal would survive, right? Or you back up on the other side of the world in Europe or something. So you don't need to worry about three copies. You have your server and your backups, and they take care of making sure it's all restorable. So you have hot backups for convenience, cold backups for insurance and disaster recovery. A hot backup is literally one server copying to another server, but that other server is not live. So it's on, it's connected to the network, but it's not responding to anything but the backup. Those are known as hot backups. So if it was horribly wrong, you can go to the server, pull the wire out of the back, go to the other server, plug it into the other one, and poof, everything's back to where it was at the time of backup. Um, it's by far the fastest way to recover from a hot backup. Uh, an alt, uh, we have semi-hot backups or warm backups where you're backing up the file system to another machine. Then if you need to bring it back, you can restore from that machine locally. And that's pretty quick. Um, cold backups are where they're archived to a completely different machine, like and they're using proper backup software and they're offsite. Uh, that's for, you know, your building burned down. Uh, somebody blew up the building. Somebody drove the car through a server rack. And you think I'm joking about that, but I've seen it. Uh, company had their server room was on the outside wall because it was the shortest path to vent the air conditioning outside. Garbage truck came along to pick up the garbage bin, missed his turn. There was a fork right through the wall into one of the servers. Um, yeah, they put in big stanchions around that wall after that. And the server was only like 40 grand. Only 40 grand. And so the, guy, the driver's company had to pay for it. So, you know, like it probably wasn't employed the next day. It was a back in the day, a $40,000 server. Um, it was like, like a four U had you know, two dozen drives in it, four CPUs, lots of RAM for the day, 20 years ago. But today it's like my laptop's got more juice than that server had, but that's not the point. So that's an example of disaster recovery of an entertaining nature. Um, usually it's more like there was a theft or there was a fire or there's a pipe that broke or tornado came through and flattened the building kind of thing. So you want to have a cold backup off-site so that you can recover from that. Then you want to test a restore process and you want to do it at multiple levels, as in can I restore from a full backup? Can I restore from an incremental backup? Can I restore whatever? Um, again, last place I worked, um, we tested our restore processes and we discovered that if we wanted to restore our version control server from a period of 14 days, it would take seven days to recover that backup from start to end. Because restore the first backup, then do each day, but it's version control, so there's a lot of files being moved around. And we needed a human meat sack to sit there and hit the button to start the next restore job. Small company, we weren't going to automate that stuff. 
So we decided at that point that we were going to go for uh, full backups more regularly because they would bring things back much more quickly. Um, once we moved to AWS, um, it was automated backups kept for 14 days with the last one falling off into cold storage. Uh, we tested a restore. So, you know, Friday at five o'clock, I declared server dead as a test. And then literally went to the backup, restored to an image and attached it to the server. I think it took seven minutes to bring it back to whatever was at 3 a.m. the day before. So yay for cloud services. Um, but you need to test a restore process. And with any kind of test, you've got to gauge your results. As in, did all the files come back? Did we lose files? Did the restore fail at any point? And you got to do this at least once a year, like a full end-to-end -end test. Um, when people talk about planning for restores and backups, they're like, ah, we're paying a guy for that. No problem. But they don't think about the downtime it takes to do the recovery. Therefore, you want to make plan your strategies around the fact that, yeah, we back up every night. No, we're never going to lose any of the data, but we might be down seven days if something goes horribly wrong while we restore the data. Um, yeah, so that's part of the planning strategies you need to do when you're planning your backup systems. So now we're gonna start applying this directly to the database world. So now we've you know discussed the joy of backups and how important they are and whatever. With database administration, one of the tasks is doing backups. And unlike file systems where, you know, people upload files to a server and they just sit there, they're easily restored. What do database servers not do? They don't stop. They're running 24 hours a day. That means their files are locked 24 hours a day. Have you ever tried to copy a big file while changes are happening to that file? It, it's never going to work. You're, whatever you're going to copy, what comes out of that may not be functional. Like it, the contents may change partway while you're copying and the files are just trash, uh, which makes backing up database servers that much more difficult. So we end up with two styles of backup, also known as an offline slash cold backup and an online slash hot backup. An offline backup is you run a job. There's the word job that I talked about earlier. It will connect to the database server, back up the databases to files. That job needs to run before the file system backup occurs. Those backups are never differential because you're gonna dump the entire contents of the database every single time. Because when you back things up, it doesn't say, hey, I just want you to copy the records into my backup. It goes back up the database and it just goes data into file. So you need to schedule these offline backups. They're files. They're easy to back up because they're not being changed anymore, et cetera, et cetera. We have online backups, which is known as replication. Uh, or multi-node servers or multi-write targets. They have different technologies to do this. Um, so the most basic version is known as replication. This is master-slave. Yes, those are bad words nowadays, but that's just what it's called. So they called it 40 years ago. It's not going to change that fast. So what happens if primary server that is running, it's alive. It receives all transactions. Every time a change happens, it cop it sends a message to another server to make that same change. So I insert a record. When after the insert's completed, it sends a message to another server or servers to do the same insert. If the main server blows up, you literally just change the DNS to point at the new the the replication server, and it's the new master. It takes over responding to everybody. In the meantime, you fix the old server, bring it back, whatever it is it needs to be fixed. Then you set it as the destination. 
This one starts replicating to the old server and everybody's happy. Then eventually, you know, you could hit the switch and move everybody back to the other server and then start the replication going the other way. It is the easiest. If it's in the same building, it's the safest. So if it's in the same building, so you've got a rack of servers. So you've got server in rack one, then you've got a server in rack two, but rack two is the other end of the building. Server one's constantly writing to rack two, server two. Server one dies, server two's still alive. It's connected to the network. Everybody's good. The DNS inside of an organization takes 10 minutes to propagate at worst. Therefore, at worst, you have 10 minutes of downtime. You're back. So that's an online backup. If you are doing a cluster of servers, it gets more complicated. Um, Amazon has a service called Aurora that does this, where you can say, oh, this is a multi-unit server. It's going to put a node in Montreal, a node in North Carolina, one in California, maybe one in the UK, one in Australia. And you're paying for each of those, by the way. It's not like you pay one price, you get one, you know, six servers. You're paying the same amount for each one. and no matter which one's being written to, it copies to the others immediately. So essentially every server is always alive and always responding to everybody else. It's pretty good for performance. It's just more complex. If you need to do upgrades and stuff, it's not a good time. Um, you need literally need to bring up an entire complete copy of it, copy everything over live, and then hit the switch. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, a large Postgres server on Amazon will run you uh, 300 bucks a month. Doesn't sound like much, but now you do that times five locations. Then you need to do a red-blue deployment, known as what's called red-blue. Green-blue, sorry. Red-blue is when things are really bad. Uh, green-blue. So you're currently on blue. You bring up the same infrastructure in green with the upgrades. You test it, you hit the switch, and suddenly green becomes live. And the next time you can do a deployment to blue back and forth. You're doubling your costs. Um, we are currently at my current job. We're currently estimating a uh, an environment where there's that sure the database servers are distributed, and our estimated cost per month is fourteen thousand dollars a month. You know, fine in the government's budget, it's a rounding error. To me, that's a lot of money, right? So it's all about your priorities also. So, and then you got the last one, which is a, uh, a, a multi-target solution where you have a single node that responds to write requests. So it's, it's a pool. It's like a load balancer. I don't know if you guys ever learned about load balancers, but essentially you connect to this one machine and it determines which server is going to answer you. So you go, oh, I want to select records from a table. It picks the least busy server, sends the command there. But if he receives an, a, an insert, update, or delete, it sends the command to all the servers. So it's not one server telling another server, it's a central node telling all the servers to make their changes. Those are kind of cool, they can be distributed, and it allows load balancing to respond properly, but it's complexity. But you can add nodes and take nodes out at, whenever you want. Okay? Where, yeah, depends where the servers are. But that's how things were done way back in the day. So 15, 20 years ago, that was pretty much the only way to have a distributed database was you have a central node in wherever in the home office, and then you'd have multiple servers, and it would just write to all those servers. Latency is an issue, but that's, you know, technology. So... On the other side, you got the recovery side of the deal where you need to restore the entire table space. You got to, you, but the cool part is, is if you have an offline backup, you can build a development environment easily. Set up a new server, restore the most recent backup, and bam, you got yourselves a hot recent dev environment. Um, you'll see that often with, uh, with some high tech companies where uh, they actually have jobs that cop that'll bring up a dev server every day that's up to date based on what was the previous day's production environment. So that when technicians need to test out fixing things, 
they can test against the dev server and know that it's as close to the real thing as they can get. Um, sometimes you need to do development on your local machine. Again, you restore a backup to your local version and away you go. Um, the worst one is recovering missing and erroneous data in tables. That one really sucks. So what happens is you have the live server, you have your backup, you restore the backup, and then you have to do a delta between the two sets of tables and just extract the changes that you want to bring back and run them against the existing server. Um, I may have accidentally truncated the wrong table one day and it cascaded because there's a parent table. Uh, I had to do that. That's how I know it really, really sucks. Um, it was a really important table too. Uh, don't ask Dan to do something at three in the morning without enough coffee. That was the lesson that day. Um, and I realized I did it wrong right away because I hit the go button and I looked at the screen. And I'm like, should have been done in 30 seconds. This is going to be three hours. So I had a backup. That was about two hours old. Restored that to my local machine. Grab the copy of the parent table. Insert all that. Grab a copy of the child tables. Insert all those. Took like two and a half hours to uh, recover the fact that I hit truncate and I forgot to finish the name of the table. So, you know, there's a table called activations. Another one was activation configuration. Oh, well. So, that's part of a database admin store if you need to restore part of the database. Out of all of these, it is the worst. It is the worst. Um, anybody here ever screw up their Word document? And you got two copies or three copies, you know, version one, version two, version three, you know, for the poor man's version control. And then you realize it needed stuff from one and from two to fix number three. And then you're like copy pasting pieces from each document to try to make a coherent document out of it. It's the same thing when you're trying to do partial repairs on a database, but much more complicated. Okay, um, the heck, I already talked about these for the most part. Cold backups are the easiest to perform. They're really good for databases where the contents don't change very much or there can be downtime. In other words, 2 a.m., you start a backup. If it's a small database, there's a really good chance the users will never even notice it's happening. So what happens with most servers, not MySQL, because MySQL is stupid, um, it will start a transaction. We'll be talking about transactions later in the semester, which basically locks the current state of the database, even though everybody else can keep making changes, but it locks the current state of the database and it copies everything to a file. The structure, the data, the permissions, everything goes into a single file or set of files depending. Those are fantastic because they're easiest to come back from. They're easiest to run. And if your database doesn't change very much, it's cool. And if the database isn't too big, the backup doesn't take too long. Therefore, people won't even notice. Uh, hot backups, they're hard to perform. Uh, they're more for dynamic or mission critical databases. Uh, I've just already finished explaining the whole clustered environment thing. Uh, so, what is cool though about um, a clustered environment where you have multiple servers? So, you got, you know, a, po a pooling server that does multiple writes, or you got the multi master setup, is you can pick a server to do the cold backup once a day. Nobody even noticed it happened because the other servers will respond while that one is taken offline for the backup. It is by far the best solution for backing up and maintaining database servers. Same token, it's also the most complicated solution. Because um, some of you will, will discover in your careers that often the best solution is often the most complicated solution. So therefore you go for a different kind of solution. You know what that other solution is called? Good enough. You have to decide if I'm going to spend four months planning this awesome infrastructure for the off chance I'm going to need to save two days worth of work. Your boss may look at you and go, 
no, you're not going to waste your time on that for the next four months. We need you to do other stuff. So then you're going to go for the good enough solution, which might take you three days to recover the files. It is what it is. All right. So where do you store these backups? On the database server, you want to make your backup to a different volume or hard disk. Why? Because if your database is running on one disk and you do your backup to that disk and then that disk stops working, why were you making a backup in the first place? Therefore, you always back up to another drive. Um, and for those of you that think solid state drives are, you know, the best thing ever for these situations where you have solid state drives, so therefore it's not like a spinning disk that gets bad sectors that, you know, suddenly one day just eats itself for breakfast and dies. Solid state drives do die. They die silently. You don't hear them dying. Um, they just start to shrink. Which some people have, I don't know if anybody here has ever witnessed a shrinking SSD before. It's a really interesting experience. Um, I had a coworker whose PC, his SSD was dying. You know when you buy an SSD and it says it's a one terabyte drive? It's actually a 1.2 terabyte drive. There's an extra couple hundred megabytes in there of extra memory that is not being used. And as it writes, it, it has a strategy that keeps it writing in different places to reduce wear. When it decides that a certain area of memory on the drive is no longer good, it marks it as dead, and then it borrows some from that 200 megabytes. What happens when that 200 megabyte runs out? It goes, oh, here's a spot on the drive where there's no data. We're going to use that and mark off that dead. So when he booted his computer, his terabyte drive was 900 megabytes. A week later, his drive is now 800 megabytes. He was losing 100 megabytes a week. I'm like, I think your drive is dead. I think you want to back up your stuff and we'll put your new drive in your machine. Um, so a lot of people think SSDs are the best thing ever. They're really cool. They're really fast. When they die, they die very, very badly. And you won't even know what happened until one day you go to do your restore and their disk is half the size it's supposed to be. Or it just dies. Like, literally, one of the chips on it dies and the whole thing just stops turning on. Um, so then, you want to back up to another drive in the same machine? Cool. You copy to another server, either on or off-site. A common thing people are doing now is they're uploading them to cloud storage. So they'll do a backup locally and upload it to an S3 bucket on Amazon or upload it to a data lake on Microsoft stuff. Uh, back up the taper disk. Um, less common, but it's still a thing. Um, tape backup, you put your tape in, it backs up. Every day you take the tape out, you put it in a box, you grab the next tape, and you rotate through the tapes until the tapes don't work anymore. Uh, as a rule of thumb, you want to have multiple locations. So back up to the local drive, back up to offsite. Okay, so when we back up MySQL, we have to decide what needs to be backed up. Uh, we have to back up the database content, so for full backups. Um, log files, MySQL allows you to do incremental recovery and point in time recovery, which is really nifty. Uh, except for the fact that it's almost impossible to do, but it lets you do it. Um, you really have to know what you're doing to do those. And you grab also the configuration information. So uh, on Linux, usually it's found in under the etc directory. Uh, it could be a my.cnf. It could be under a MySQL directory, depending what you know flavor of Linux you're running or Unix. Uh, if you have any cron jobs that run, those are jobs that are scheduled to run every day or every hour or whatever. Probably want to back those up. So for the config files, the cron jobs, that kind of thing, you might want to use a version control system. Git, Subversion, uh, Bazaar, insert your preferred version control system here. Um, that way you can restore from version control. Okay, so MySQL has something called a binary log. It contains all the commands that change data or the actual data is modified row-based. Um, it contains extra information, such as how long did this query take to run? Um, it's stored in a binary format. That's why it's called the binary log. 
so MySQL comes with a command called MySQL bin log. And you need to turn it on because by default, MySQL doesn't have the binary log. It doesn't keep it unless you tell it to use it. And then what it does, it creates log files in sequence. So 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, on and on and on. And the binary log keeps track transactions so that when it runs, it will do, um, it has an index file that keeps track of all the binary log that were used. What happens is every once in a while, my, uh, the MySQL reaches a checkpoint, what's called a checkpoint, and it determines that everything that was in the binary logs has been applied to the database safely, and it purges them. It only keeps whatever was there since the last checkpoint. Um, you can determine how long these checkpoints are. Um, but usually, you know, they're usually set pretty small so that you don't have insane amounts of files being uh, accumulated. So when you use the binary log, you can use the binary log to do an incremental recovery. So you do a full backup using the MySQL dump command. It creates a file, 1 a.m. So at 1 in the morning, backup runs, a full backup is created on the disk. The bin log starts at that point. So now it's going to be on for, say, 24 hours. It will write out every command that was sent to the database server in those 24 hours. So then what you can do is, oh, I need to restore because, again, Kevin wasn't paying attention and Kevin killed the database at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. There's financial transactions. We can't just say, well, whatever was at 1 a.m. yesterday is good enough because we're losing financial transactions. So what you do is you restore the full backup and then you do a replay of the binary log. File one, file two, file three, file four, one after another. Guess what it doesn't have? A quick way to run these through. Somebody's gonna have to run, literally run them all in by hand, which is why this is difficult. Um, so MySQL dump is interesting. It creates an SQL file and it you can tell it to dump the table or the whole database. And in there you will find create table commands and insert statements. That's how it does its backup. It actually gives you a human readable SQL file that has every command needed to bring the database to the point where it was backed up. Now you can think about this a little bit more. Let's say you got one gig of data. The backup file will be significantly larger. Why? The command to create the table will be there. And when you're copying the stuff in, it's not copying one row of data, it's the insert statement had that one row of data, which means insert into table A, parentheses, column one, column two, column three, column four, whatever, 25 columns, close that, values, parentheses again with all the values, close parentheses, semicolon, and it'll do that for every row. So the backup for MySQL is usually 70% larger than the actual disk like what's on disk. So if your backup is a gig, it'll probably be 1.7 gig file. Ah. But it is what it is, because that's how MySQL works. Um, you can actually transfer the data directly into another database server. So you could go MySQL dump, and then you feed it the database name and you can pipe it into another MySQL command that's connecting to another server. So you can literally do a dump in memory and as it's being dumped in memory, it's being sent to the other server. Um, works really good for smaller databases. If you've got a database in the gigabytes, terabytes range, it's probably not a good plan, but it's something you can do. So MySQL dump has a few cute tricks. Uh, you can do single transaction. So that means that when it dumps a table, it creates a snapshot of the table, then backs up the snapshot. So at least the table itself will not change during the transaction. Uh, you can issue lock all tables. Lock all tables is cool, but nobody can read, nobody, nobody can write to the files, to the disk while it's happening. So you're connected to MySQL, 
and you go to update a record, the backup is running with the lock all tables being enabled, guess what? It's not going to work. The update won't save. It's going to just give you an error. You can still read, but you can't write. And all DML statements are just backed up. Essentially, it goes into the log. As soon as the backup is done, it'll fire them off one after another. So oops, there's that. And then you've got the log files. So you can tell it to flush the binary logs. So it'll do a checkpoint. Spidey sense was tingling. Battery's almost dead. We live. All right, so if you want, as part of the backup process, you can tell it to flush the, flush the binary log files. So what it'll do is it'll do the backup, and then it'll add all the other commands from the binary log to the end of the backup. So it backs it all up, creates all the insert statements, and then it'll actually log, log in the insert, the updates, and the deletes one after another after everything else. So it can rebuild it to whatever point in time you did the backup at. So you start the backup at 1 a.m. and it takes half an hour. It'll keep track of those commands for that half hour and append them so that, you know, it's as fresh as it can be. Um, yeah. So that have been said. Um, rule one, don't ever use MySQL for financial transactions. Um, if you're using something like what they have in Amazon, like in R what they call RDS or Aurora, sure, cool. Because it's not really MySQL. It just pretends to be MySQL, and it's much safer. Um, the number of times I've seen MySQL crash and corrupt itself is extensive. Um, and, you know, actually doing proper backups is, is a challenge because the backups are so big. Um, previous job, we had a Postgres database that had about the, uh, I think it was about 16 gigabytes. Its backups were 12 gigabytes for a 16 gigabyte disk because of how it stored its backups. We had a similarly sized MySQL one and the backups were 20 gigs. It was stupid. Uh, like a restore could take five hours. So MySQL is it's good for small websites. You're running a WordPress site, that kind of thing. Great. Should you run a store on it? Well, if you're running WordPress, you don't really have a choice. But, you know, if you're a big company that's doing a lot of transactions, you're probably not running WordPress as your CMS and your e-commerce solution anyways. So, all right, off to restore. Restore, we're almost done, actually. Um, so, a restore. We always got to do the definitions first. We're going to take a backup. And we're going to return the database to whatever point in time it was that we did backup at. Same thing applies to a disk. You take the backup, you bring it back. So why do we want to restore? The first one is things went horribly wrong and you need to bring it back the way it was. So that's recovering from failure. You want to make another copy of the database, whether for development or a staging site or whatever. Um, or you want to recover the fact that somebody screwed up and deleted records they shouldn't have. In MySQL, how do you do a restore? You go MySQL, and by the way, I'm going to warn you now, when you go to do this lab, Windows users, this is where I warn the Windows users, use CMD, don't use PowerShell. It will fail if you try to use PowerShell. Spent time one semester trying to figure out why their, the lab wasn't working for a student. I realized we were using PowerShell. Uh, the greater than sign has special meaning in PowerShell. Uh, Mac users, the command looks exactly like this. <laughs> so yay for Mac users. Uh, it's the only time I'm proud of you. I'm sorry. Shouldn't make fun of the Mac users, but you know it is what it is. Um, because actual fact, MySQL on Mac is just like MySQL on Linux. So it's closest to the real thing as you can get. 
So you restore by running the MySQL command prompt command, the greater than sign, less than sign, sorry, the other one, backup.sql or whatever the file is called, what it'll do is it'll read the contents of the file and feed them into the MySQL command. So it literally reads line one, create table, line two, insert, line three, and it runs through the file line by line, the whole file. So back to my whole, hey, it's a 20 gigabyte backup. How long do you think it takes to read a 20 gig text file line by line? And there's a really good chance your computer will run out of memory trying to do it, which is why I'm not a fan of how MySQL does its stuff. Um, and if there's incremental changes, so if you're running the binary log, you can go MySQL bin log with, you can see, you know, host name dash, whatever it is. So the name of the server, pipe it into the MySQL command. So it'll just run the commands through the MySQL. So bin log takes, reads the binary file, and then literally prints on the screen the commands. Then you pipe it into the MySQL command, and magically you get your point in time recovery. So you can literally go, hey, this bin logs from 3 p.m. So we can run everything from before 3 p.m. But you're going to be doing them by hand, one file at a time. It's a fun time. Okay, so there's links on the slide. The slide's on Brightspace. Uh, but all the different commands you can run to do the backup and the restore and all that fun stuff. Um, yeah, that brings us to the end of this. Now, I am going to talk about the lab really quick. I told you guys this was going to be a quick lecture. Um, hang on. Bright space, you slow today. Okay. Uh, lab six. Oh, went too far. Way too far. Okay, lab six is really short. Now, the thing I want to highlight is this chunk right here as part of the setup steps. Um, so in Windows, it depends on where it installed. Okay, so if you used the Microsoft, uh, the MySQL installer for Windows, it's gonna be under program files, MySQL, MySQL server eight, bin is where your commands are at. If you have some other flavor like WAMP or XAMP or whatever, and you're using that version of MySQL, it's going to be somewhere under that folder. On Mac, I have no idea where the files are. Just, just saying, if you're really lucky, they've put the binary path for MySQL stuff in the path. So you probably don't even need to know the whole path. You just need to know, you know, MySQL, MySQL admin, MySQL dump. As long as you, those commands run, you're good. I don't know if it the, the MySQL installer, you know, the, Hey, I took this thing and I just dragged it to this folder. Magically adds everything to the path. I have no idea. So, um, worst comes to worst, it's probably under applications, wherever applications is, and then it's going to be binary files. But this work, you're going to be at the command prompt for the whole thing. We're going old school. Um, and then you are going to run the backups, and essentially you're going to run some commands. And you're going to capture the output. Some people say, hey, this outputted like 75 pages of text. Cool. I want the last couple of lines or the first couple of lines. I don't care. Just show me some of the content. Screenshot will do of whatever's on the screen by the time the command's done running. I mean, if it's backing up a file that's 1.5 megabytes, doesn't sound like very big to you guys, but 1.5 megabytes is a lot of text. I don't need, I don't want all that in a Word document. Please don't do that to me. Just take a screenshot of what the output looks like. Um, and then some of them is just run this command and see what happens. Uh, Mac users, do not include the .exe. Actually, I think it's even mentioned in there. Don't the .exe. So in Windows, it'll be mysql.exe. On Mac, it's just mysql. So. In the past, I've had varying questions on this lab because of the differences between Windows, Mac. Mac installed a different way. Windows installed a different way. And then you get the neckbeard running Linux, uh, which is cool because they're the ones that can e actually help the easiest. <laughs> but 
Um, yeah. This lab's pretty straightforward. You just literally just run the backup commands, capture the output, run the restore command, capture the output, and you're done. Okay? Any questions? Going once, going twice, going three times. Done. And 